Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our day, which is entitled Lean Team Global Scale. Uh, I'm James Mayhew. I'm the Commercial Director at Codehouse. First of all, let me just give you a quick introduction to Codehouse. So we've been delivering websites for global brands since around 2007. And as you can see, we've been doing that for some of the biggest brands in their respective fields. We've also delivered work for numerous law firms, including some of the very largest in the world. We help organizations modernize their digital capabilities uh, and deliver digital experiences through which those organizations can engage with clients, prospects, partners, and colleagues. And that's just a summary of how we, we put across the sort of the, the modern, how we modernize enterprises and how we deliver those digital experiences. Um, We've been inspired to run this webinar, um, as it often seems the case that the digital teams responsible for engagement within large law firms are significantly limited in terms of capacity, but still expected to deliver results on a global scale across multiple geographies, jurisdictions and languages. As is often the case, the enemy of success is not necessarily the technology, but it is the time to plan and coordinate and execute. And this very much impacts a firm's agility in successfully delivering and maximising the results from a time-dependent marketing event or campaign taking place. We're also often asked, what does good look like? <clears throat> and this has resulted in our development of these five steps to digital leadership. The fundamental thing here is to, is to put yourself in the place of the client and use that thinking to apply to help structure the digital experience you should deliver for whatever the wider context. Where does somebody start? What does a first great experience look like? How will you maintain their interest and draw them back and so on? And you can see more detail on this in our digital playbook uh, for law firms, which you can see the reference to there. So from that, I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Sean, who can pick up on the rest of it. Thank you, James. And very good to meet everyone. And thank you for joining the webinar. I'm the head of growth at Codehouse and also run our insights team. So one of the things we want to talk about today is really the challenge that James uh, so well articulated, which is the challenge that many law firms face, which is often that to deliver client services, you have to be where your clients are. This is particularly true pre-pandemic, but it's still the case even post-pandemic in a more remote world where clients want to be in the same time zone or, or at some point want to be able to meet you face to face. But what ultimately that means is that law firms have a geographic, you could be in one, in one country, but in multiple offices, or as many of our clients are, they are in the UK, but also spread across multiple continents. And so that then leads to different challenges to deliver high quality marketing experiences. So indeed, many law firms, to the majority, if you look at the full distribution of law firms, are based in one country, but potentially have multiple offices. Or as I mentioned, we have many clients who are in multiple countries and have multiple offices. So then the sort of corollary of that is then if you've got multiple sort of client servicing offices, how does that then get delivered from a marketing perspective? And so we tend to see is that there are three different sort of generalized approaches in from a marketing perspective. And so that is that there's a fully centralized marketing team where they are able to deliver marketing operations for the whole sort of global organization and take that on uh, from a centralized perspective that has uh, strengths and, and weaknesses. The kind of hybrid of that is that there's a sort of partially decentralized. Just for the recording. So what we see is there's a fully centralized approach that many firms of a certain scale find to be the most efficient, which is to have all of their marketing capability in one central location, and then they support those different local offices. But a different approach is to partially decentralize it, and that tends to be as the law firm scales, particularly across multiple uh, regions and to different time zones where it actually becomes a little bit more practical to allow those local marketing capabilities. Although generally, uh, we see that they are quite uh, similar ground compared to the sort of the client services facing teams. But what uh, we generally see is that those local teams have some capability to deliver marketing. So that might be, be able to write news, run local events on the website, but generally the kind of management is held still centrally. And then the sort of the third pillar of that is that you have an almost fully decentralized and autonomous local teams. But in, in almost all cases with the global law firm, there still has to be some central governance to maintain consistency from a brand and content perspective. So that's diving down to the detail. What does that mean from a content publishing perspective? When we think about those local teams, can they publish to any part of the site? Do they have full control, say, if it's a, a regional site? So let's take an example of a law firm where they're headquartered in the UK, but they also have a presence in the United States of America. Can the American team also publish content uh, across all of the um, sections of the website, or is it only that they can publish to certain sections? That might be, as I mentioned, to the news. They want to be able to 
make their section of the site feel fresh, but are happy not to have control over the services section of the website. And that allows to have greater consistency. What we've seen with one of our global law firm clients is that the taxonomy, when we went through the process, had, was aligned between two merged organizations where almost similar services had very different naming conventions. And so throughout the sort of digital transformation, they went through a process to harmonize the naming conventions, at least at the top level. So each of the top level services were given the same name, but then the local markets had some flexibility to within the same sort of information architecture to, to localize it, to make it make sense for their local audiences. And so then from a standardization perspective, how do you make sure that what you deliver through the website and your digital channels remains at least somewhat consistent so that so going back to branding 101 the expectation for a brand is that if you take the mcdonald's example wherever you go in the world if you turn up and a big mac on the menu you expect that big mac to be pretty well the same whether you're in new delhi or if you're in london and so from a branding perspective that is ultimately the challenge that that law firms face when they are trying to scale as a global organization and have that reach, but also maintain consistency whilst not having the same level of resources. So the sort of typical global scale B2C organization, marketing is heavily invested in and is seen as a, a core driver of growth, whereas typically, and we see that many law firms are stretched from a resource perspective um, when it comes to marketing. And so one of the things that we see has, has worked particularly well is the implementation of a digital asset management system so that all regional offices and the global team can dip into the same uh, pot of uh, content via that videos, uh, images, and obviously uh, even we've seen an increasing basis using um, tools that leverage uh, large language models is the ability to apply a consistent tone of voice to written text. So that's using tools like Writer and Jasper. We did a project for uh, one of our global law firm clients and one of the challenges they were seeing was that they were building lots of localized campaign websites across all of their different markets. But the struggle was that each of those teams didn't have a common basis to do design work. And so they were using local agencies to create those most sort of microsites, but they didn't have a basis to maintain a visual consistency apart from trusting on the eye of the local designer in that market. We developed a design system so that they had a consistent set of components that in this kind of toolkit allowed those local marketing teams and their local design agencies and build agencies to create consistent touch points, which obviously one improves uh, the speed of delivery, but also maintains that consistent approach. So coming back to that, that McDonald's example, the Big Mac in uh, in New Delhi is the same as in London. Any microsites that that law firm delivered would be exactly the same. One of our global law firm clients had the challenge that each of their local markets wanted to be able to create microsites and local campaign pages at the speed that the marketing team needed. And so they were finding that each of their local marketing teams were reaching out to um, local design and development firms, but they didn't have a common basis to create those microsites. So we, we developed a design system so that they had a common basis to have a set of components and templates so that depending on the type of uh, microsites or campaign page, they were able to quickly leverage what had been created to deliver that consistent experience. So going back to the idea of any big map you go into from New Delhi to London, they would have the same content and uh, brand experience wherever uh, they were in the world. To the next key. So multi-region, multi-language, this is one of the the biggest questions that any of our clients ask us when we start a new project, it's possibly one of the most complicated and simplest things to answer. And in any discovery process, this is one of the things that we want to tackle and get right. And it is both a content question and a, a governance question. So what is the desired end user experience, but also how can we deliver that experience to our client. So there's a set of questions that we ask whenever we enter into that process with with a customer. One of the questions is about the sort of translation. So that taking an example of a, a firm that has a presence, let's say again, in UK, perhaps their headquarters in London, but they also have an office in Madrid. So perhaps the main language for the company is English, but they also want to deliver an experience that works for the, for their Spanish speaking clients in Spain. So on the first question, and this is a relatively simple example for a two office law firm, but obviously the complexity expands the more offices and more locations and languages that you add into the mix. But one of the questions we'll ask is from a governance and content creation perspective, 
where do we land? Are you able to ask that, that local office, that team in Madrid, to be able to translate the content from your, let's say, UK or global version of your website? Or do they not have the capacity and would you be comfortable uh, relying on an external agency? The third option, which is about using AI machine translated content, is something that we do see, but that's typically when there's a real large scale global organization where they're having to have multiple languages in multiple locations. So it's probably not the first sort of port of call, but it is obviously getting better large language models like GPT-4. O oh, and Gemini um, Pro are really good at translating content into almost any language. And so almost getting to the point where at least as a first pass from a translation perspective, machine translation is a really good option. But this is a first question that we would ask our customers or certainly in that first um, discovery call. Then this is, this is driven also by that translation question, but probably the first default point is that if you want to have a global site but, and you need it in multiple languages, we would say, yeah, have that global site and translate it. And so there's basically the same one-to-one -one map. So from English to Spanish, every single page is in English and is also in Spanish. But that creates a challenge because then if you do want your local offices to um, be supporting you, then they need, every time you want to create a new page in English, they're also having to create the same uh, content in Spanish. So there's logistical and process content challenges in following that approach. Another approach which has the benefit of being able to allow those local teams to have a more regional presence is to have your global site and then allow those local teams to have a regional site. There are then questions about to what extent does that regional site mirror the main global site? Is it once all pages are the same and they inherit almost all the global pages except they can also create additional pages on top of that? Or is it a global site and then the local site is almost its own standalone website? So when you're on the global site and you change your regional language, you're then taken to a very separate place. What we tend to see in that approach, unless the local teams are able to deliver and support content fully independently, that over a period of time, that content tends to then drift. And then you start to see content tend, uh, stagnating because those local teams don't have the capacity to keep the website as fresh as the global website. And so, yeah, the, uh, sort of the answer to this kind of very simple question actually then to kind of obviously becomes it depends. And it is really about getting into the nitty gritty of what is your specific organization's needs, capabilities to then determine what is going to be the best experience alongside what is the customer expectation. And so indeed, the key consideration here is does that local site mirror the global sites? Do they have the capability, as I mentioned previously, to create their own service pages? Or is it only that they can say, we have an event coming up and we want to be able to have the flexibility and not rely on the central team to, to create that content for us. We feel that we're a burden. We just want to get it up as quickly as possible. So you, within the site architecture, you can just allow them to have uh, the permissions to be able to create content in very locked down uh, places with a set template so that if you if brand consistency is a, is a concern because you, you've seen challenges with the local teams being able to do that then you have the ability to control that a, a key question that always comes back up in, in these conversations is the fallback strategy so depending on how you've architected your website if they if you if the user reaches a page that say is available in english but then they want to see it in spanish and there isn't a page available in Spanish, then what, where does the user get taken? Or, or vice versa, if they've landed on a Spanish page, and I'm, well, I'm saying Spanish in the sense of either it's Spain and it's in Spanish, and they then want to see it in English, but it isn't available in English, what, what do you show them instead? So all of these are sort of types of questions that we would be going through and almost like a sort of a logic tree getting to um, a recommended answer at the bottom of, of that sad question. And one of the things that gets driven by all of the sets of questions that we've um, already answered um, in that discovery session is then what's the domain structure. If you look at the history of the internet, probably going back to the 90s and into the early 2000s, the top level, the, the country code for top level domains is probably the most sort of common strategy. Take an example like google.com was their first website. Then as they localized, they had google.co.uk and they went to South Africa, they had google.co.za. But that approach is generally not as common today. And if you type google.com or oh, sorry, google.co.uk, you're probably forwarded on to redirect it to google.com slash UK. If there's a need to localize, that's the typical approach. So then the other approach is having a subdomain, which might be like en.example.com or the Law Firm's website. But generally that approach also is uh, not as common um, today because of concerns around not getting the most benefit from the SEO 
that you have juice that you're delivering on each of those websites. So the folder structure, which is the most common approach, which is lawfirm.com slash en, and then that would be for the language, but en hyphen en, which would be location, and then having the same sort of structure for all your other language and regional sites. And that has the benefit of keeping all the site structure within one tree in your CMS. It is really good from an SEO perspective because all of the value in those um, different content pages is all sort of pointing towards that core domain. So this is really diving into the weeds, but all of those other questions lead to something a little bit more technical from an implementation perspective. Um, and this is one of the things that we see probably going most awry when we pick up and take on a new um, one of our clients' websites that's been previously set up. So the hreflang is something that Google and other search engines look at to know that each of these pages are different versions of the same page rather than being treated as different pages and then so seeing very similar content and then marking the page down and impacting the SEO. So hreflang is a way for a search engine, not an end user, to know uh, what a page content consists of and what lang and that there are language variants. But there are just some, and so this is the kind of the markup that we're showing there is what would go in the head, which is the sort of top bit of a, of a page that a user doesn't see, but a search engine can see. We can see some of the challenges that uh, we typically see when we pick up a solution from an hreflang perspective. So an hreflang uh, needs to, on every single page, needs to be self-referencing. So even if the page is the definitive page, so if English is your kind of core global language for your website, even the en page needs to reference back to itself to say this is the main page I want to reference. You you would be surprised, but sometimes even the the spelling of the particular sort of language tag sometimes there are mistakes, and then that leads to Google not being able to find it, and then treating as I said before each of those separate pages as separate URLs with similar content, and so then it affects the SEO perspective. Reciprocal linking is then each language needs to link to each other, so the the Spanish version needs to link to, link to the French, but also the French needs to link to the Spanish. So it's not just uh, one direction it has to be set up bi-directionally. Then correct codes is very much about EN being the language lowercase and then EN capital EN being the, the location code, having those set up. So sometimes we've seen that the location code is set up as the same, so it's EN lowercase and EN lowercase, and then that confuses Google and then you lose all the benefit of, of what you're setting. So if any of the above would get picked up in a good SEO tool like SEMrush. And so these are the kind of things that we'd be flagging and when we pick up a new solution. And that last one is, just, is about um, can you referencing. So Google also wants to know if you've got similar content using the canonical reference, we have to say this is the definitive bit of content, but can kind of supersede an href lang. So they have to, this sort of has to be done very carefully. So if, if the canonical is in place and then it, it's superseding the href lang, Google gets confused and then thinks, oh, actually, you do have multiple variants of, the, of this content. And so then we're going to score you down. So all of these things are there from a search engine perspective to make sure that the, uh, the the right page gets served to the user and then also that the SEO doesn't get marked down. Just thinking just a couple firm scenarios that we to pull all this together and make some sense. So from a UK only firm, the centralized architecture is really the ideal setup. We don't need to have anything that's too complicated. It's all UK focused. It's all in English. And so what we want to do is make sure that your regional offices have are sort of marked up properly using the, the, the right schema, which means that if someone searches in Google, it comes up. So if they search for your law firm and Liverpool, or even just law firm and Liverpool, that because you've got the right schema, uh, the, the markup that Google expects, you have a higher chance of, of surfacing um, high up in the Google rankings. But then for an international firm, where, as we said, they're not at the scale where those local marketing teams have the um, ability to deliver all of the marketing that those uh, regional offices need. We need that hybrid approach, which allows you to kind of maintain that brand control uh, with some ability to sort of have the right language in place um, and some localization perhaps on, on specific um, pages. But there's always tension between central and regional teams, which no doubt if this maps to your own firm, you'll um, feel very familiar with those challenges. And then for the largest of law firms, that global approach with the localized marketing teams is a whole, almost a whole other webinar in terms of how you get those content governance approaches in, in place from having the dam, having a design system, having even a content marketing platform where you can manage the governance and the projects of each of the different campaigns in one place. Certainly worth, worth diving into if this uh, applies to your firm. Now, that is everything that we had to cover in today's webinar. I'm really grateful for your time. Have a great rest of your day.